right, welcome. It's the Friday edition of the Waves of Hope uh, Chapel Service. And so we're so glad that you could tune in and be a part of uh, what's going on here at Canaveral Port Ministries. And, uh, and so I just wanted to start us off with prayer and uh, also give you a little heads up. I'm very excited about uh, the worship music this morning because Josh is going to play the guitar for us for the first time. Uh, and we get to hear how God's gifted him that way. So Karen, uh, pretty excited for you getting to hear your son use one of his gifts. <laughs> All right. So I uh, just wanted to uh, go over the uh, prayer guide. And this is a quote from Martin Otto's excellent book, The Seafarer's Mind. And if you don't know it, uh, Martin has sent this out to many different uh, cruise ship captains and has given it to them in PDF form for free as a way for them to connect with hope. And so we're very excited about that. And if that's something that if you're a seafarer out there and, and you'd like to get a copy of this book, let us know. We can send you the link and you can download it. But um, this is a quote from a captain it says, am I stuck in a trap? There is always a danger of a trap wherever we may be. It is how you perceive things, which makes the difference. I believe that making the best of where God has placed you and living it to the full will make your life more meaningful wherever you are. As a Christian seafarer, my goal is to serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with the gifts he has given me and a life of dedication to his mission. So praise the Lord for that Christian Captain Nelson Stileo. Um, and today, the uh, specific prayer request is pray that the crew members feeling trapped will find freedom in Christ, and there is no better freedom than that. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the beauty of the day. We thank you for the life that we have, the health that we have, for uh, just a chance to live today. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bring freedom to those that do feel trapped. Father, we thank you that ultimate freedom comes from Jesus, being set free from our sins, being set free from the things that weigh us down, uh, being set free from the guilt of carrying those sins. And we thank you that you have paid the price for all those things and that forgiveness can be ours through Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that those that are, are having that sense of feeling trapped, maybe it's feeling trapped on a ship, maybe it's feeling trapped in some other way, that you would just lift their burden today. Mm -hmm. I pray, Father, that you would encourage them, that you would Help them, Lord, to uh, just have that sense of your presence in their life. And I pray, Father, that you would bring joy. Father, we thank you that uh, even though we can go through a dark night of the soul, that your mercies are new in the morning. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for uh, your word and our time to study it today. And I pray that you would give us ears to hear. I pray that you would uh, just... Uh, be with Josh as he shares with us this morning that we would hear you through him. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is living and active. We invite your Holy Spirit to come and, and just help us uh, to understand, to apply it to our lives, to help us to grow in our faith. And I just pray for, um, for everyone out there, Lord, whether they are uh, watching here in the States or somewhere else, that you would encourage them. And we thank you for all these things, and I pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So come on, Wendy and Josh. Hi there, we're going to sing, uh, or I'm going to sing uh, Waymaker.
let me switch chairs. Um, move this right here and be kind of centered up. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, today, I get to do something kind of neat because on Saturday, sorry, all my days are kind of blending together. I got to start Paul's second missionary journey, and now I get to finish it. So I get to bookend his whole second um, missionary journey. And if you remember last Saturday, Paul's journey started off pretty crazy. Um, it was differently than he planned. Three separate times he planned to go one way, but he kept going, or God wouldn't allow it. The Holy Spirit stopped him. And he ends up going northwest, going into Greece, going to Thessalonica, to Athens, um, comes back um, towards Corinth, and today we're going to pick up in Acts 18. And um, you can go ahead and f uh, flip there, but um, this is him leaving Corinth. And so this is Acts 18. We're going to be reading today verses 18 through 23. And what I want you to keep an eye out for in this passage is this one little thing. I'm not going to give it away, but... Luke, the author of this book, he just throws it in there. It's just kind of like an aside. He's just like, it's just different from everything. You know, one of these things doesn't look like the other type of thing. So keep an eye out for that little um, thing while we're reading it. I'll give you a hint. It's in verse 18, but we'll, we'll get there. So let me read it to you, and then, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. So starting off in verse 18, this is what the word of the Lord says. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, and then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off in Sincre because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila, and he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if, God, if it's God's will. Then he set sail for Ephesus. And when he landed in Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and went down into Antioch. And after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there, traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, and strengthened the disciples. So, what was that thing that uh, Luke just threw in there? Uh, it's It was a vow, right? And... It's kind of weird how he just threw it in there because he's like, well, Paul's moving from here to here to here. And by the way, while I was here, he cut his hair. There's no description of the vow. There, it doesn't say why he's taking it. But we know that if you're taking a vow, it's something serious, right? It's something that's important. Or you might see that something is so difficult to complete that you should take a vow. And when we think about vows today, we see them all over the place. Like every president that becomes president of the United States, he takes a vow to go into office. If you get married, you make some pretty significant vows till death do you part, for better or worse, richer or poorer. Those are some pretty serious vows that you're taking between each other. Or if you testify in court, you might even say, you know, I don't just tell the, the truth, but I'll tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's a pretty serious vow. Or maybe you're like me, you've been in situations where um, you're like, God, if you can get me out of this, I'll do anything you want. Um, I remember in high school one time I forgot that we had a test, and I just remember praying, God, if you give me this test, I'll go anywhere you want. I'll do anything you, you need me to do. I just, I just need to pass it. If, I, I didn't even know that we had it. I think I maybe have studied it. I don't know. But if you can just get me through this test somehow miraculously, just give me all the right answers, I'll do anything you want, which is kind of the craziest vow I think you could ever take. But, um, <laughs> you know, in, in preparing for this, I was looking at the, the word for vow and oaths in the Bible, and it's actually referenced 82 times. So that's a, that's a good amount of times for a word to be used. And when looking at it, a lot of the verses were pretty conclusive about warning you not to take vows. Um, it doesn't say that it's a sin, you know, thinking back to um, the... Uh, sorry, that threw me off for a second. But um, uh, thinking back to getting married and taking those vows, it'd be a pretty silly thing because we know that God loves marriage, that um, that it represents the church to him. And, uh, and it would be silly for him to be like, well, you know, here's some marriage vows that'd be a, a sin so that we're going to start our marriage off with a sin. That's That would be silly. Um, but um, 
I think there's a couple principles that we can learn, even in this short little reference of, from Paul and, uh, and how he, that he completed it. And so the first one is this, that a vow, it's all about your integrity. And so straight away, um, whenever I'm going to give you an opinion, but this opinion's not found in the Bible. Um, this is just what I believe Paul was, Paul was doing here. It's my best guess of why he took the vow. And, you know, when we think about vows, probably the most famous one is a Nazarene vow. Um, John the Baptist had taken it, and oh, what its whole and sole purpose was to set you apart and make you be different from everybody. You, you weren't allowed to cut your hair. Um, you couldn't drink wine uh, or any type of alcohol, which would have been hard to do because it's not like water was very clean back then. Um, you couldn't touch anything that was dead or blood. So that was a pretty pretty big deal, but we know it wasn't that vow because he would have had to take it in Jerusalem. But I think the vow was this, that he was taking it simply because he, he wanted to be reminded of why he was in Corinth. Because he cuts his hair right after he leaves Corinth. And, um, you know, if you think about the city of Corinth, I know Mike talked about it yesterday, talked about uh, it a little bit, but they were their most famous building was actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the temple to Artemis, or I mean, I'm sorry, Aphrodite. And in it, they had temple prostitutes that you would use for worship, I guess. And um, Corinth itself was like a modern day Las Vegas, or if you were to think about Brazil's Carnival Festival just happening all year or long. That's kind of how this town was. The, the underlying rule that was the unspoken rule is that anything goes. So Paul not cutting his hair, I think, was probably just a way for him to remind him why he was there. You know, I'm going to do this because every time that I have to brush my hair behind my ear or my, I, I get up and my hair's in my face, it's going to remind me, God, I'm here for you. I'm here for your purpose. And um, it, that just kind of reminded me of this quote. It actually was from one of my high school um, football coaches. He, he used to say this to us. He'd say, character is who you are when people are watching. But integrity is who you are when nobody's watching. You know, it's not easy to do things when all the cameras are on you. Um, but it's a lot easier to do things when you have that pressure, that oversight, than when you don't have any Body looking over your shoulder, you know, and that's what integrity is. It's vows and oaths. They they test you to remain truthful to your word. And when Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount, he actually says it's better not to take vows. He says this, and it's Matthew um, five thirty seven. He says it is better to just let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. And if you think about it, if you're if you're taking a vow, ultimately. This is God's world. He's sovereign over it. So if you take a vow, it's between you and him. Even if it's with another person, there's, in, in some way, it's kind of like there's three people in it. And so a vow is about relationships. And so the first thing is that, the first principle we got to realize is that a vow is about integrity because it's going to test who you are. And the second thing is this, is that your word is really all that you have. And so if integrity is the way you act, um, your word is really who you are, and it will be shown in your actions. And in Matthew um, 7, 16, it's, um, Jesus says this, that they'll, it, when talking about who is a Christian and who's not, he says, we'll know them by their fruit. We'll know them by the fruit that their life produces. We'll know if they're a good tree or a bad tree. And in, as Christians... We should take that very serious. You know, the oaths we take, the vows we make, they don't only reflect us, but they reflect the Lord that we represent, Jesus Christ. And if we're called to be Christ followers, it's kind of like this. Uh, imagine, you know, I don't know if you like painting, but I know there's a lot of people that um, are auctioneers and they work in the art gallery. Well, one of my friends on board, he was Jackson. He was talking about these paintings and Jackson I hope you're watching this because you taught me a lot one day but you were like look at the brush strokes in this picture isn't that crazy or look at how they blended these colors together and it creates a whole new one well that's exactly how the world looks at us because to the world we are the image of Christ we are the portrayal of Christ and so our word is all that we have because that's what everybody sees 
And so those, that, that's really what a vow is. It's going to test who we are and what we're made of. But also I feel like there's a warning in how Paul went about it because as soon as he gets out of Corinth, he cuts his hair. And I think the third principle is that it should be completed quickly. Um, you know, Paul cuts it, his hair um, immediately, but also every reference um, that talks about this pretty much, almost all of them, talk about do it as quickly as possible. Make haste um, when completing a vow. Why? Because it's it's just common sense. You know, the the longer you are trying to do something, the more rope you give yourself to hang yourself. Or, you know, the deeper you dig the hole that you can fall into. And so I want to read a, a Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 through 6. This is just, um, a, just a great example of what the Bible has to say about vows. Um, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to, to fulfill it. He, that being God, has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not make protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry about what you say and destroy the work of your hands? And so, the neat thing about vows is, yes, it's something that you take before God. Yes, it's something that's serious, and most of the time it's, it's taken at the start of a covenant, which is a special relationship that we and a special vow that you make before God. But there is redemption. And that's my fourth principle is, you know, we're not always going to keep our word. We're going to fail. We've all sinned and we're going to sin again. But the God who created this world and everything in it, a perfect and holy God, the ultimate vow keeper, because even from creation, or the moment that we sinned, he said, I'm going to bring salvation to you through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says this in Romans 8, 1, that therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in Matthew 7, 7, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And these are promises or vows. These are oaths that God has made for you and I. And maybe you haven't been a person of integrity. Maybe your word doesn't mean anything because you trample on it daily. Well, welcome to the club. <laughs> we, we all are like that. And to be honest, Christians, we're probably the worst ones at it. Because we know the truth. But the good news is this, is that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want to encourage you with this morning is maybe you haven't been a person of integrity. Maybe your word doesn't mean anything. But that can change today. Because all you got to do is put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ, and he will not only come beside you, but he will walk with you. And I hope that challenges you to think about your life. I, think it, I hope it challenges you to say, Man, Lord, I have not lived up to my word, but I know you care. Because you're not just a bully on a throne waiting to smite me or punish me. But you made a way for me to have a relationship with you. And so my question, I guess, for today is this. Will you accept him if you haven't already? Will you make a vow to him today? Say, Lord, I want to be yours. I want you to adopt me as a child into your family. Because that's exactly what he does. And when you become a Christian, you get full sonship or daughtership into his family. You get the rights of Jesus Christ. That's called justification. Or maybe you're just sitting here today and you're, and you're just like, God, I haven't been living my life for you. I made a vow to you and I haven't kept my side of the promise. I haven't kept my word. But I want to. And I don't know how to. But I want to surrender my life to you. I, I challenge you to do that. And so that's my encouragement. That's my challenge for you this morning. I hope that it, it will do that. Um, and... I hope that you will stick with us for the rest of the book of Acts. It's starting to come to a quick close, and um, we really enjoyed you being with us. Um, please be encouraged on the ships. I'm so happy that the anthem is on its way to India, or, or actually it's there. So I saw that cool video that Royal Caribbean put out. So 
welcome home if you're if you were on a Royal Caribbean ship and you're Indian. That's great. I'm so happy for you guys. I hope that you get some well needed rest and relaxation. But if you're out on a ship, um, let me just say a prayer for you and for everybody else that's watching, and we'll go on and have a, a great day or a great evening wherever you're at. So, dear Lord, we just thank you for today. God, we thank you that you are the ultimate vow keeper. That, Lord, even, even from the moment that you breathe life into this earth, Lord, that or in, into our lungs, that, God, you, you made a promise that I will make a way for you. I have made a way for you. And Lord, I, I, I pray that if anybody is, is thinking that I've never seen a vow lived out, that they, they would just look at you and say, God, if you're God, that means you're perfect. That means you're holy. I can trust you with this. And Lord, that they would trust their life to you. And Lord, I, I pray for anybody that's on a ship right now, Lord. I know that it, you've spent over two months on board, but Lord, it's hard. God, I pray for a sense of peace. God, I pray for unity um, on those ships between all the, the seamen. Lord, that, um, that, that you would just bring them together in a way that, Lord, you wouldn't um, allow division among them. And Lord, I just pray that um, you would just bring an end to this virus. Um, it's not like this virus can hold anything over you, God. You, you are sovereign, and Lord, we just pray for that right now. Lord, we thank you for this day. We praise your name, and we thank you for who you are and what you did for us. Lord, we love you. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow. Same time, same place.